everybody who uh, has only a slight knowledge of European law knows uh, two groundbreaking judgments of the European Court uh, of Justice. They were mentioned already in Massimo's uh, talk uh, today. Uh, one is the decision uh, Van Gent and Loos uh, handed down in 1963. And the other one is, uh, this was a decision from the Netherlands. The other one uh, emanated from Italy. Costa versus Nail handed down one year later, 1964. Few people know that uh, these two judgments contributed to the democratic deficit of the European Union contributed to the lack of acceptance from which the European Union suffers and uh, which, of course, endangers the whole European <coughs> project. Uh, as I think that not everybody in this uh, uh, hall uh, is a lawyer, I very briefly say what was decided in these uh, judgments. Van Gent and Loos decided that European law applies directly in the member states this does not mean that European law does not need a transformation into national law as is usual for international law. This is already, can already be seen in the treaties. Rather, what the court decided was that European law does not only oblige the member states, but that it also entitles the market participants. In other words, these judgments transformed objective duties of the member states into subjective rights of the market participants. That's to say, economic actors could claim that national law was uh, uh, in contradiction with European law, uh, and uh, uh, they could bring these, could, could sue uh, uh, their states for the national courts, and if the national courts uh, had doubts or found that there was a contradiction, they had to refer the case to the European Court of Justice, and this judgment coming back from the European Court of Justice was binding. Costa added that uh, European law does not only have direct applicability, but also enjoys supremacy. That's to say, European law trumps national law, it trumps even the highest national law, national constitutional law. Why are these judgments uh, groundbreaking? I think for two reasons. The first one is uh, these two consequences uh, cannot be found into the text of the European treaties. Uh, that's to say this is interpretation of the treaties. And interpretation always means that there is a certain leeway uh, uh, and uh, interpretations are not absolutely necessary. They may be well-founded, but there are always alternatives. Now, here the alternative uh, was taken in the sense that I just described. <clears throat> Secondly, groundbreaking, because with these two judgments that expanded the scope and uh, the applicability and the reach of European law, the ECJ at the same time uh, increased its own power. And the third reason is that uh, the result <clears throat> was a power shift from uh, the democratically legitimized and accountable institutions to the executive and the judicial institutions of the European Union. Uh, these long-term effects were for quite some time not at all noticed. Uh, they were not noticed in Europe and it was American observers uh, who first found out what really had happened through these two judgments, and they called it, this was a constitutionalization of the treaties. Does not mean that the treaties were transformed into a constitution. This is not uh, within the powers of a court, but it meant that the treaties were now endowed with functions that usually in nation states the constitution has. The immediate effect of these two judgments was that the member states were no longer needed to establish the common market. The ECJ could take this into its own hands. It could take it into its own hands 
by declaring national law inapplicable that, in the view of the ECJ, was an impediment to uh, the common market. Everything, of course, now depended on how the European Court understood European law and interpreted European law in a more unitarian way or in a more pluralistic way, <clears throat> market-friendly or state-friendly, more liberal or more social. And I think one can say that uh, the European Court of Justice developed a missionary zeal in uh, establishing the common market. Some people have said it was a court, it is a court with an agenda. Normally courts don't have an agenda, they just decide cases. It was a court with a mission and an agenda. And uh, uh, the parts of the treaties that profited most from this missionary zeal of the European Court of Justice were, of course, the four economic freedoms. The court interpreted them, this was also already mentioned uh, uh, this morning, uh, not only in uh, an anti-protectionist way, that the treaties were anti-protectionist was explicitly the purpose of the treaties and could be derived from the text, but also in an anti-regulatory way. And uh, uh, the court prohibited, pro uh, interpreted the prohibition of state subsidies to enterprises as not only applying to private enterprises, but also to public services. So this jurisprudence left deep marks in the legal system of the member states. Uh, many protectionist standards fell, consumer protection, labor protection, health protection, etc. A number of the privatizations that we have experienced in the last years has uh, its origin in uh, this jurisprudence. And, and I think this is perhaps the most important uh, uh, result and mark on member states' uh, laws. The states are no longer in a position to decide what they want to leave to the market and what they want to do in uh, their own uh, uh, regime. So what we have is that there are now two paths, two ways toward integration instead of one. There is the original path, which is provided for in the treaties. The member states conclude or amend the treaties. Uh, the member states uh, make European secondary law. That's to say this is a way toward integration by legislation. And there is another path not provided for in the treaties. And this is the path that uh, is taken by uh, abolishing national law to say this is a way by or to, toward integration by interpretation. And the, these two paths differ considerably. The first one is political. The democratically legitimized and accountable actors uh, can use it. It's open, it happens in the open public. The public can intervene. The other path is non-political. The executive and the judicial institutions can take this path they remain among themselves. It's not transparent. The public has no chance to intervene. But the fact that this second way is a non-political way does not deprive the decisions that are taken of their political nature. If you uh, remember what I just said about the deep marks that the jurisprudence leaves in the legal system of the member states, then you can see that these are decisions of an extremely high political impact, but taken in a non-political mode. However, the European Court of Justice can only abolish national law. It cannot fill the gaps that it creates by abolishing national law, because uh, these gaps can only be filled by European legislation. And legislation is not the business of courts. Uh, Fritz Scharpf, uh, who spoke, was the first speaker in this conference, described the situation that derives from this uh, fact as an asymmetry between positive and negative uh, integration. Negative integration meaning deregulation on the national level, positive integration meaning re-regulation on the European level. 
Negative integration happens by a stroke of the pen of the European Court of Justice. Positive, legislation, positive integration requires European legislation, much more difficult than uh, uh, just a stroke of a pen of a court. We have uh, areas of the law where filling the gap uh, that uh, the abolition of national law leaves work quite well. Uh, protection of the environment is a field where all the gaps were closed and uh, for uh, many uh, cases even better than national uh, environmental law was, but there are also other areas where this did uh, not happen. I would like to add that this asymmetry between positive and negative integration is at the same time uh, responsible for a certain liberalizing effect that the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice had. When I say a liberalizing effect, I don't say that the court follows uh, a, an economic agenda, that the court has an economic theory which it uh, tries to put through by judicial means, but I say that the fact that the court can only be active in a negative way and not in a positive way contributes to the fact that there is more liberalism on the European level than almost every member state would have liked to have it and even might have been allowed to do it according to their constitution. I think this is valid uh, with the exception probably of the United Kingdom, but the United Kingdom may soon no longer be uh, a member state of the uh, European Union. That's to say that, and I think this gives some idea about the uneasiness of so many people about the European Union, uh, this shows that the people uh, were confronted uh, with a degree of integration that they had never been asked about but couldn't change either even if they did not like it. Why uh, is that so? Why why couldn't the member states change the jurisprudence of the ECJ if they thought it has nothing to do with their intentions when they founded the common market, or if they thought it has a, a negative effect? After all, the member states are, as we like to say, the masters of the treaties. The European Council determines the, the purpose, the direction, the pace of integration. The Council of Ministers is the main, not the only, but the main legislature. So there should be possibilities for the member states to do something about this situation if they dislike it. The answer, the explanation why they cannot do it is constitutionalization. Everything that is regulated on constitutional level is no longer open for political decisions. Majority decisions cannot apply in the field that is regulated by constitutions. Elections do not matter where questions have been decided on constitutional uh, level. This is the function of constitution to uh, limit a majority rule, uh, to provide protection of minorities, etc. This is why uh, we have constitutions. We have them for this limiting uh, uh, matter. Uh, but uh, uh, just because uh, of these effects of the Constitution, uh, we can see that national constitutions uh, confine themselves to a rather small number of fundamental rules. Constitutions, what do they do? They determine the purpose of a political entity. Uh, they uh, uh, determine the structure of a political entity, uh, uh, establish the organs. Uh, name their powers, name their procedures in which they decide, and usually uh, you would find a number of uh, fundamental rights or other principles. So this is what usually goes into a national uh, uh, constitution. All the rest, all the rest is left open for political decisions. All the rest is below constitutional law, is what we call ordinary law. That's to say that the democ democratically legitimized and accountable actors have a say here. They are not excluded here. Elections matter if uh, they change uh, uh, the relevant parties or if uh, uh, they uh, uh, give uh, expression to value changes in a society or whatever. In other words, constitutions regulate 
political decision making, but they leave the decisions themselves to the democratic process. And this distinction between constitutional level and ordinary law level, between constitutional law and between ordinary law, is crucial for constitutionalism. But if we now compare traditional constitutions of the member states uh, with what has been constitutionalized by the European Court of Justice in the EU, uh, what we discover first is, of course, that the treaties, the object of constitutionalization, are much more voluminous uh, than constitutions uh, are. And uh, why is that so? It is so because they are full of what would be ordinary law in every member state. Imagine, for instance, that the whole antitrust law of Estonia, I hope Estonia has something like an antitrust law, would be in the Estonian constitution. Or half of the commercial code would be in the German constitution. This is the situation that we have in Europe. One cannot blame uh, the six founding states that they did that because they were not aware that they were writing a constitution. This were, they were told this only a few years later by the European Court of Justice, so we cannot blame them for that. But the effect of the constitutionalization is that an object was constitutionalized that has little in common uh, with uh, uh, constitutions. I think maybe surprising to one or the other uh, uh, in this room, but I think we can formulate uh, a general rule. The more constitutional law, the less democracy. And now I would like, to, would like to add to what the American scholars found out when they uh, discussed and analyzed the two groundbreaking decisions, namely this was constitutionalization. I would like to add the European Union is not only constitutionalized, it is over-constitutionalized. And this over-constitutionalization is responsible for a power shift from the political institutions of the Union to the executive and to the, uh, and to the judges. Every judgment of the European Court of Justice that is based on the treaties is an implementation of the Constitution, and that's to say no institution below the Constitution has the possibility to change that. To be sure, the member states are not without any possibility to change things, but the only possibility that exists is amending the treaties. And uh, everybody, I think, is aware uh, that amending the treaties is uh, extremely difficult. Unanimity among 28, or maybe soon 27, uh, member states. And for a purpose like redirecting a line of jurisprudence of the courts, an amendment of the treaties is never uh, available. So I think if we ask ourselves what is to be done, this is uh, the question of this section, uh, if we ask ourselves what uh, one can do in order to enhance a European democracy, I think one has to start here. One has to start here and not, as most people think, by increasing the powers of the European Parliament, uh, uh, giving the European Parliament more powers, maybe even the powers that national parliaments uh, use uh, to have, that's to say transforming the European Union into a parliamentary system, wouldn't uh, uh, solve the problem that of over-constitutionalization that I just described at all. Uh, enhancing the powers of parliament would leave the problem of over-constitutionalization totally unaffected. So what can be done? If the problem is uh, depoliticization of decisions that in their nature and impact are political, then the solution must be repoliticization of these matters. And how can one do that? One can do it and in uh, that way uh, that one undoes the over-constitutionalization of the European Union. That's to say not reverse, not uh, turn the wheel back regarding to constitutionalization. I think we have lived with this uh, uh, more than 50 years. It has been accepted by the member states, never 
formulated in treaty amendments, but formulated in a protocol of the treaties, which has the same uh, legal uh, uh, importance uh, as treaty provisions. So what I suggest is not uh, turn the constitutionalization back, but draw the consequences out of these constitutionalization if the treaties have adopted the nature and the function of the Constitution, then let's formulate them in a way that only those provisions that have a constitutional value remain on treaty level, whereas everything that in the member states would be ordinary law is downgraded, is downgraded to the level of uh, a European secondary law. What does that uh, bring, which effect does that have? It opens the doors, it doesn't deprive the European Court of Justice of its role to interpret and to decide uh, cases, but it opens the door for the political institutions of the European Union. Uh, it makes possible what is possible in every democratic state, that the legislature can redirect the judiciary by changing the law. Legally, this is very easy. It would require one single paragraph in which uh, we list uh, which provisions of the treaties are not of a constitutional uh, nature and are therefore downgraded. So this is maybe very difficult to find out exactly what is constitutional, what not. There can be discussions about that. But doing it in a legal way, I think, would be extremely easy. Politically, it would be extremely uh, difficult because it requires a treaty amendment. And uh, it will be the more difficult as long as the problem of over-constitutionalization has not even been noticed in the general public and also in the political realm. Thank you.